the White House initiative to boost black educational outcomes. Is it a game changer? A look at the ground game both nationally and here in the district. Washington Full Circle starts right now. Welcome to Washington Full Circle, I'm Furman Patterson. Simply put, closing the achievement gap in America means removing obstacles to the success of African Americans from the time they're born through college. And it begins with education. With us today is one of the men tasked with closing that gap, David Johns, Director of the Initiative on Educational Excellence for African Americans. Thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you for having me. Now, first of all, how do you get to this point? What in your life uh, drove you to this mission of doing this? I think three things. One is faith. I am somebody who is the recipient of sacrifices that were made by people who never knew that I would be able to live my dream in this way. Um, and I'm clear that I've had a calling on my life to be an educator for as long as I um, can acknowledge, and I resisted it for quite some time as well, um, but that's the first thing. The second, um, acknowledging that a child's first and most important educators are his or her parents. Mm -hmm. um, I had a mother who, um, like many members of the African American community, has always um, talked about and ensured that at our home, uh, education was central. Mm -hmm. um, and so I knew, um, in addition to the fact that I was a child of God and that I was black and that meant that I was beautiful, that I was going to graduate from college uh, before I knew much. Um, and then I think the third thing um, is taking a lot of risks. Uh, my career has been spent trying to find ways to increase access to opportunity for um, children who are most often neglected and ignored or just otherwise rendered invisible. Um, but in particular, when I think about the path that has led me to this position, to have been appointed by President Obama to lead this initiative that he created in this administration, um, it's taking calculated risks. I see. So this all began with um uh, what was the name of the organization? It was Initiative. Uh, the uh, White House Africa. Initiative yes. on Educational Excellence for African Americans? Uh, no, before that, there was a uh, something else. My Brother's Keeper, I think, was the original community so, initiative. Interesting. This yeah. is actually a good question. <laughs> so um, this the initiative that I run, mm -hmm. um, which has a really long title, but I refuse to shorten it in part because <laughs> we don't hear those words too often, right? Um, educational excellence in African Americans are often not something that we think about at the same time, in spite of the fact that the data shows that African American students, in spite of being pushed out of the spaces they need to be in still show up and now are celebrated for being resilient and having grit. But it was established by President Obama um, three years ago almost to the date. Mm -hmm. um, two years ago, the president launched the My Brother's Keeper initiative. Now, it's important to note that in the first year of the first term, the president established the White House Council on Women and Girls right. to ensure that there was a focus on women and girls. Mm -hmm. And then later in his administration, established the My Brother's Keeper initiative to honor uh, unique opportunities to support and respond to the challenges that often boys and men of color face. But those two, the council and the initiative, are separate. Mm -hmm. We very much work collaboratively. Um, but my initiative is one that is um, unapologetically focused on closing both opportunity and achievement gaps for black students specifically beginning before birth and extending through college completion and career entry. So slightly different than the My Brother's Keeper focus on boys and men of color universally. Um, so where we're talking about black men mm -hmm. um, or Afro-Latino men um, in the context of MBK, we will show up to specifically honor that, but our work is much broader. Understood. So what, what would you say are the main obstacles to academic success for, for boys of color? Who? Um, so this is challenging in part because we try not to do the deficit work, right? So um, often people will talk about the problems um, that are often attributed to our students, but are really a result of um, the fact that in too many communities throughout this country, a child's access to opportunity is predicated by code, um, zip code or genetic code. Mm -hmm. um, if you give me a map and a few other conditions, I can um, by and large tell you what a child's life comes will be based on statistics, right? Um, and and so that's the first thing, is acknowledging that we do not yet have an equitable system uh, providing students with the skills, resources, and experiences they need to be successful across the country. The second thing is that too many of our, I call them babies, I was a kindergarten teacher in New York City, uh, and they'll always be my babies, even though some of them are now graduating from high school. Um, but our, too many of our babies wake up on any given day um, in Washington, D.C., or in Inglewood, California, where I'm from, or Inglewood, Chicago, question 
determining whether or not there will be a caring and concerned adult who will support them as they mm -hmm. go through life, right? Pursuing excellence um, is not easy, right? If it were, everybody would do it, some say. Um, but there are too many children who wake up not having a caring or concerned adult who will shepherd them and provide them with the safety and security they need to feel mm -hmm. comfortable, um, or who don't have educators who show up uh, simply conspiring to ensure that they are successful. Um, I think those two things are foundationally important when talking about the challenges that our babies face. Well, so far, how are you gauging the success of this initiative. Uh, I think you'd have to ask our partners, um, but what we have focused on, given that there are, again, a number of things that we could have attached ourselves to or policies that we could have focused on, we try and add value in three core ways. And remember that um, I run an office that does the work of engaging with um, external uh, partners outside of the U.S. Department of Education and mm -hmm. other federal agencies, as well as working within and across the federal government to leverage our resources in ways that, again, fill opportunity and achievement gaps. Uh, but we try to do, at a minimum, three things. One, one is um, highlight how it is that our programs, policies, and practices impact students, in particular black students, right? Mm -hmm. So often it's the case that, especially in Washington, D.C., when uh, adults want to think about what they can do to support students, we gather in rooms with other adults, we reflect upon what it was like when we were in school some X number of years ago, mm -hmm. and then we design solutions, seldom ever asking students, what do you need? Uh, what do you want? Uh, what are you doing now that we should do as adults to be able to accelerate learning and development opportunities for you? Mm -hmm. And so we, by and large, host summits and do other things where we give students the ability to sit like I'm sitting now and to talk about the things they need in order to, again, feel safe, engaged, and supported. The second thing we do is try and highlight best practices. So we take away the excuse that we don't know what's working, because in, in large part we do, right? Um, and so we leverage social media to host uh, what we call AFM Ed Chats. We have an AFM uh, film school screening and discussion series where we highlight things that are positive in nature, but mm -hmm. then also allow us to talk about ways that caring, concerned adults can show up again and support learning and development. So anywhere where we can show up and highlight things that we know are working for black students, birth through college completion and career entry, we try and do that. And then the last thing is that we work with national partners who are engaged in the work of supporting learning and development. Um, so that's everything from school districts. The Oakland Unified School District, for example, has the African American Male Achievement Initiative, AAMA. Uh, we work with them to help amplify what they're doing and find ways to bring resources to accelerate it, um, as well as with individual schools, our community-based organizations, all committed to supporting, again, the learning and development of our babies. Uh, we're just getting started. Lots more to talk about. Up next, a historic plan by the District of Columbia to expand academic opportunities for males of color. Washington Full Circle will be right back in just a moment. Story, young man. I'm gonna tell you about my beginnings. I'm the son of a prostitute. My mother, she had a couple of addictions as well. I was born in 1980 in Las Vegas, Nevada, a very difficult time for that city. By the time I was four, I had to take on a lot of adult responsibilities. At that age as well, my mother walked out of my life. Some of you can identify with that. That powerful statement is from the man charged with the historic mission of launching a male-only public high school in the district. Welcome back to Washington Full Circle. Joining us now is Dr. Benjamin Williams, who will serve as the school's principal. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And indeed, that was very powerful. Um, what is it that, that made you want to jump into this, uh, this mission of establishing a historic males-only school in D.C.? Well, first and foremost, you know, when you when you go through a beginning the way that I did in my, my early childhood, um, you start to realize that the safe space for you, uh, especially through foster care, is, is school. And the people who had the greatest impact on you were teachers and principals. Mm -hmm. um, and so as I got older, graduated college, and realized that this was the mission um, that it was intended for me, 
uh, and I took it to heart and, and I wanted to have a greater impact than just myself and, and be as unselfish as possible and give back to the community as much as possible. Uh, as I started my doctorate, my research really started to be geared towards underrepresentation of African American students in our gifted and talented programs. Um, but particularly started looking at our underrepresentation of young men, especially as they get to the college level and, and some of our career fields, and wanted to figure out exactly where was the point where we lost that, that drive in education. And so uh, I knew eventually that this is something that I wanted to do. I never thought that I would be at this point in my life and being able to accomplish one of the, my major goals. And so when this opportunity came about, I felt the need to, to to apply for it and, and hopefully be the individual that was selected in DCPS. I think they chose the right person, and, uh, <laughs> but I, I'm fortunate. And, and again, you stated a little earlier about being blessed and, and being guided by something more powerful than us. And I, I truly feel that. And, and I feel that this opportunity came about at the time and, and point in my life when it was supposed to. And so. Uh, now, uh, David, uh, is this something that you had in mind, that the initiative have in mind uh, when you set out to establish that? Uh, very much so, and I think two things that I want to underscore um, that are central to the story are, is one rather acknowledging that uh, for black men that graduate from college, teaching or going into education is among the top three professions, right? Mm -hmm. In most years, it's, it's number one, mm -hmm. right? And so while the majority of public educators are white women, right, it's important to highlight that black men who are supported and have the ability to go to college and graduate choose to serve in the way in which we have, right? Formally being educators or otherwise finding ways to increase access to opportunity. And then the second thing is that all students need safe spaces, mm -hmm. right? There's not one among us who can count ourselves being successful and not consider in some way, shape, or form the role of an educator, right, who helped to shine a bright light or spark an interest or affirm for us that we are doing that which we're supposed to be doing. But all of our students deserve to have safe spaces. And so if it's an all-male school or environment that they need or a single gender in any way, shape, or form, there are schools that focus specifically on, on students that are homeless or otherwise neglected and ignored in that way, I think that it is important, we think that it is important to ensure that there is a space for all of our students. So, yes. Uh, much more to talk about. This is uh, fantastic. More on the initiatives to tackle the achievement gap for African Americans when Washington Full Circle returns. And welcome back to Washington Full Circle and our discussion on closing the achievement gap for African Americans. Now, Dr. Williams, tell us where we are with the plans for the school. Well, right now we're, we're finalizing the academic culture and, and also the social emotional plan uh, that we plan and put in place the first year of the school. Uh, we have started the remodelization projects as well. Uh, the first floor of this Ron Brown building will be fully remodeled for our young people to enter um, on August 2016. And we're still in the process of recruiting the students. Currently, uh, we're about, I would, I would say approximately about 80% of the way there. Uh, we still have many slots that we have to fill and so we wanna just make sure that by time August 15th or you know May 1st comes along, we know who all of our students will be in order to start that process of meeting the parents and getting to know the kids intimately as well. How did they apply? Uh, uh, they the applied via DC, uh, DC, P, well, no, it's not DCPS, my apologies. It is the um, DC org's um, lottery system, mm -hmm. uh, myschooldc.org. Right. Um, each student had to be a student of DC, a rising ninth grader, and identify as a male. And that was the only criteria for, or for applying via the lottery. And so there was no application process, there was no test. Uh, it was really just about making sure that the young men wanted to be a part of this, this situation and that their parents were supportive of them um, actually applying to the school right. as well. Now, you mentioned your story. How will this school deal with issues like the social and um, emotional issues? Well, right now we're in the planning process. Um, and part of what we want to do is not only teach the young men academically, but we want to teach the whole child. And part of teaching the whole child is social emotional learning, as well as cultural competency and relevancy in the classroom as well. And so we plan on doing a few 
innovative things. They have been tried and true to, in other schools as well. We're looking at doing community community meetings on, on a daily basis uh, where we really tackle some of the issues that the young men will be dealing with at the time and also will pro uh, probably deal with as men once mm -hmm. they get older. Um, and so that's part of the social emotional learning piece that we really are, are really going to try to tackle. Uh, we are hoping to, again, by starting the school small, we'll get to know the families very well. And so our goal is to have a, a strong partnership with parents and finding out exactly what these kids are interested in and, and guiding them to help them prepare for whatever career field that they're actually interested in in the ninth grade and hope to pursue later on in life. So uh, we're, we're hoping to be, we're hoping to be a, a small intimate school and that every adult in the building knows every student. And we know issues and we know families and we know, uh, what type of resources that we have to find and put in place to make sure that these young people or these young men are successful. So David, you've seen a lot of these young men at the White House, we turn on TV, we see the president with uh, young uh, males of color from all over the country. What do you see personally when you talk to these young men? Uh, I, I see a number of things. Uh, I think the first thing, as we were talking earlier about Toni Morrison, and she wrote in Sula that black men are the envy of the world, in part because we can hold court literally on the corner or in the White <laughs> House um, and be fly in every space in between, right? And so the first thing is just to honor and celebrate that in spite of facing some significant obstacles, right? Mm -hmm. The U.S. Department of Education has data in the Office of Civil Rights that underscores the rate at which black boys are suspended and expelled more so than the white white male counterparts, not more so than females, but still more so than the white male counterparts. Um, we're sort of denied opportunities to be able to show up in our full selves and be brilliant. But in spite of that, young men still go to the spaces where they know they need to get the skills, experience, and credentials to be successful. Uh, the second thing, and I would just continue to echo the importance of it, is acknowledging that young men are still developing mm -hmm. well beyond the point of them sometimes reaching six feet in height or being 225. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, an interesting moment on a panel um, recently during the Teach for America Summit where a student, a junior at Chavez Public Charter School said, um, people don't want to teach that which they're scared of. And so thinking about, again, the number of white female educators who are in our classrooms who simply don't have the support or the structure that allows them to get to know black men and understand that children are still developing well into the point after they've graduated high school is critical, right? And so having a school that understands that and that embeds that into the culture is, is essential to their success. Um, and then I think the last thing is to acknowledge, and, and the question was important as well as a response, um, that social and emotional learning is as important as cognitive development, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have to be hypersensitive to the fact that uh, now, for example, uh, black boys are committing suicide at three times the rate of their uh, non uh, minority counterparts, right? Amazing. And that's a rate that's yeah. doubled in the last 20 years. And mm -hmm. so at a time where some people are debating whether or not Black Lives Matters, we have to be sensitive to the things that our boys are, are facing and that they're, they're grappling with. And so having a school that is um, clear about those things and is putting in the resources so that all of their needs, cognitive, social, and emotional, are met is of critical importance. And to add to that, mm -hmm. um, we feel that it's very important to, to provide a skill set for navigating post-high school world. Um, it's not about just getting the young men to college. It's about preparing them to graduate from college and become productive citizens and hopefully come back to their community and do something similar to what we're trying to do, is, which is give back. And so I, I totally agree with what you were saying. It's just a matter of how do we really do this? You know, and this is just a great way. Again, this is another option in D.C. that DCPS is providing for our young men. And my goal is to be as transparent to the young men as I possibly can about what we're trying to accomplish and what our goal is. And, and our ultimate goal is to have young men come in as young men, but graduate as men who are ready to be servants back to their community, who are young men of high character, but who also understand academic curiosity and seek that academic curiosity for the rest of their lives. And again, this is just prepping young men mm -hmm. to be successful men and not not to continue to be the stereotype. I, I want to emphasize anti-stereotype, anti-stereotype in a positive framing, but to understand that this is what our mission is, and each one of them are going to be a part of that, and they will be a gold standard for what educating, well, how, edu how we educate African-American and minority young men in this city. So, so obviously you will be a role model. They'll see you I and so. see <laughs> your, yes, your no, story. Already so. is, but yeah. as, as David said about having um, African-American male teachers, how will you address that? Is there a push to try and include that in your school? Yes and no. Uh, we are going to have um, 
both genders in the in the building, and we're going to have multiple races in the building as well. Um, and, and part of becoming a global citizen is understanding and being co culturally competent themselves, mm -hmm. understanding how to navigate different cultures and be a part of different cultures, but also how to respect womanhood at the same time. And and I feel that there's there's a great power in having men and female develop young men because they need to be able to be a representation of a female at some point in their lives or their mothers, their sisters, their aunts, their cousins, or whomever themselves. might, or themselves, <laughs> yep. absolutely. Diversity and, and all so, forms. And, and, and they must understand how to be that and have the skill set to do that. And so uh, we want to have strong people in the building. It's just, it's not about race or, or gender. It's about how strong of a person you are, what type of person you are, and what you can give to these young men, and how you can help prepare these young men for their next steps. So, so David, what kind of partnerships, or what kind of support are you getting from businesses and from philanthropists uh, in this endeavor, this initiative? Um, so our work, the work of the initiative is supported by a commission, some mm -hmm. 27 individuals and experts throughout the country. It's chaired by Freeman Robowski, who's mm -hmm. president of UMBC and spends a lot of time and his life work has really been focused on increasing access to the STEM fields for mm -hmm. African Americans and other underrepresented communities. But a lot of what we try and do is highlight, for example, the work that's happening in DCPS and then drive resources to be able to support and or amplify the things that they need. Uh, terrific. Now, quickly, the curriculum, uh, do you have some things in mind? Will it be arts and will it be all those traditional things? We will be a college prep school. Uh, my goal is, again, my, my study, uh, my research was on the underrepresentation of African American students in AP courses. And so our goal is to get as many young men enrolled in AP courses and passing the AP exam as well. Um, and I feel that's, that's our, our focus because it, there's a strong correlation with how well you do in AP on the AP exam to how well you'll do in college. And so we're a college prep school, so we must make sure that our young men are ready for that. For At that the access. risk of being persnickety, my hope is that I heard you ask art or, right? And I'm just, I'm channeling my inner Freeman Robowski, which is that we have to be liberated by the, the beauty of both and and not beholden to either or. So sometimes we have the conversation and say, are we gonna focus on math or art? When there's a relationship between the two, right? Yeah. Like there's 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 connections between all of it. And in fact, students don't show up in classes and say in the middle of a lesson, hold on, are we doing M right now? Or is this the engineering part of it? Like they just want to be engaged. And often by t saying to a student who might like music, for example, that there's math in the music. distance between striking a piano key and the sound it makes, right? Allows us to understand that these connections exist in ways that sometimes adults make more complicated than they actually are. Excellent. And, and and that's much more to talk about, but we're going to have to have you both back if you promise. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, thanks. Yeah, look forward to it. That's it for Washington Full Circle. Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching. We'll see you again next time. We'll be home.